Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll get the latest on the state budget in our weekly legislative update. Also tonight, State Treasurer Jeff DeWitt talks about education funding alternatives to Proposition 123. And we'll take you to a restaurant working to reduce food waste. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Maricopa County Attorney Bill Montgomery said today that his office is working with the Department of Public Safety on the freeway shooter case, which appears to be open again after a judge on Monday dismissed charges against original suspect Leslie Merritt Jr. Merritt had been accused of a series of freeway shootings in the Phoenix area last summer, but the court ruled that the case be dismissed without prejudice, which means that prosecutors could refile against Merritt in the future. The Arizona House and Senate are getting ready to pull a trigger on a budget deal. Over a dozen bills were introduced last night in the Senate, with the House looking at companion legislation today. It all makes for a harried atmosphere at the Capitol, something that Minority Leader Eric Meyer says doesn't have to happen. It used to be that, you know, different portions of the budget would go through different committees and more of the members were involved. Essentially, this budget was crafted by the, the leadership in the House and the Senate and the governor with no other input. And that's part of the problem in the House is that they left a whole bunch of people out, didn't take their recommendations, and all of a sudden they've got a minor revolt on their hands. Joining us now with more in our weekly legislative update is Jim Small of the Arizona Capital Times. Jim, good to have you here. Uh, is, is there a little bit of a revolt happening there? Now? The, the House is not uh, moving as quickly on this as the Senate. Yeah, I, I think, you know, th there's, there's definitely some, you know, some conflict in, in the House that, that is leading to the process not moving as quickly. Uh, you know, the Senate uh, today, in fact, right now as, as we speak, they are uh, hearing these budget bills in the Appropriations Committee. Uh, they introduced them last night. This, the House uh, is, is set to have an Appropriations Committee tomorrow morning and set to introduce the bill sometime, sometime between now and then and, and uh, get them assigned to that committee. Um, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, and, and a lot of that is because of kind of this conflict. There's a group of, you know, I'd say at least a dozen. I mean, we've heard anywhere from a dozen, you know, maybe 15, 16 people, uh, Republicans in, in the House Majority Caucus who have been dissatisfied by the amount of information they've been given on the budget and uh, were, were not pleased when the negotiated agreement, uh, the, the agreement negotiated by the House Speaker David Gowan, Senate President Andy Biggs, and, and Governor Doug Ducey, that, that when that agreement came back to them, that it really didn't reflect the priorities that they had told their leadership to take into the negotiations. They, did, they didn't feel that they got basically what they'd asked for. So basically, House members, Senate, it sounds like, again, relatively swimmingly, the process, a series of bills that make up the budget going through the Senate. They still have to work a little bit further, but yeah. things go. The House, you got a bunch of folks saying, you didn't listen to us, mm -hmm. or you didn't quite understand what we wanted. We're not happy. Uh, are they going to be happy? Uh, remains to be seen. I, I'm sure at the end of the day, yes. I mean, I'm sure that there will be enough people that get happy enough to vote for the budget. Uh, it's just a matter of kind of how quickly does that happen and what needs, to, what changes need to be made to the plan as proposed in, in order to make that happen. I, you know, I think fundamentally the big issue is K-12 education uh, and, and is making sure that uh, the funding for, for K-12 is, is appropriate, that there aren't some of the, there's, there's some, some policy changes that result in, in basically funding cuts to K-12. Uh, and and also you know j just a little bit of extra money for mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of particular programs, um, you know fundamentally it's a 9.6 billion dollar budget. I mean this may come down to you know 30 to 50 million dollars in terms of you know increased spending in specific areas and maybe a, a couple of policy changes. And, and the and the policy changes you're referring to a current year attendance as opposed to previous year attendance. This can be very complicated, but it does impact how much money schools get. Give us a, a basic lesson here as to what's going on. Yeah, so the, the way school funding currently works is school districts are basically, the amount of money they get for any school year is based on the number of students they had the prior year. Uh, a couple of reasons for that. One, it lets stability in budgeting. So when a school, when a governing board meets in April or May, they know how much money they're going to be getting for the upcoming year because it's for the students, for the number of students they just had in, in their class, in their classes. And, and it also gives school districts a chance to adapt and plan in advance for when their enrollment starts to drop. Uh, and so if, if a school district goes from 1,000 students one year to 950 the next year, they've got a year to basically figure out how to absorb the loss of funding for those 50 students. I mean, what classes do we need to consolidate? What maybe support staff don't we need? What teachers don't we need? Things like that. The proposal that was adopted into last year's budget basically forces school districts to, to, to do a budget 
anticipating how many students they're going to have in the in their classrooms for the upcoming school year so a governing board right now would be meeting to plan for the august school year but they wouldn't know how many students they're going to have they, they they have to make it a best guess plan a budget for it if the number of students comes back less than that then they're going to have to pay that money back to the state that they anticipated having or, or that they received in the state budget uh, so it, it's you know, it, it's something that, that kind of uh, makes life a little bit more difficult for schools, uh, and it fundamentally school districts that lose money from year over or, or lose students from year over year are going to have that that one year transition where yes. they're basically going to lose that funding. They're not going to get that funding, uh, and, and so essentially it's about a thirty one million dollars savings in the budget, but that means it's thirty one million dollars that some school districts are going to have to basically eat. And the smaller rural districts, I, I would imagine, would really get hit hard by this. Without a doubt, the the fewer number of students you have in your school in your school district, the bigger disproportionately the impact is. Okay, so you got the House wrangling over these changes. You know, a, a bunch of folks, Republicans, uh, kind of saying, "Hold on, here, we need to fix this problem that you just explained." Um, if they fix the problem, let's say they do something about current year as opposed to previous year, the whole nine yards. It still has to go back to the Senate, does it not? And are they going to be happy with that? Well, so far, I think that's one of the holdups has, has been, you know, the, the original idea was on Monday they'd show up, they'd introduce the budget bills, they'd, they'd vote on them on or Tuesday, take them to the floor, and then today would have been the final vote and they'd be sending them off to the governor. Uh, obviously not the case, not, not, the, not the plan we're on now. Um, and, and I think a lot of that has to deal with, you know, the Republican, in, Republican reaction in the House and uh, an attempt to try to broker some kind of a, a compromise or, or some kind of a deal that would satisfy Republicans in the House and get them on board. From what we've been hearing, the Senate really isn't interested in doing that, uh, especially on this particular issue. I mean, they, they see it as, as a good policy shift and, and as a way to save money in the budget. And, and you know, I, I think really the biggest challenge in, in trying to adapt to what these House Republicans are looking for, if, if it's anything long term, any kind of permanent change, it's going to be tough because the budget plan is structurally balanced by $2 million, which means that the ongoing, the permanent revenues the state collects are greater than the permanent expenditures that mm -hmm. the state anticipates. That's the first time that's happened in, an, in a generation. So that's been a, a huge selling point for Governor Doug Ducey. It's been a huge selling point for Andy Biggs in the Senate. So any solution, I think, is probably going to have to work around that and try to figure out a way that how do we work around that $2 million in permanent spending? I was going to say, it, it, it sounds like it's, it's causing problems in the House and, and changes could possibly cause future problems in the Senate. What about the governor's office? What's he saying? What, what are they saying about all uh, this? They're being pretty quiet. Uh, you know, I think behind the scenes, we, we've, we've gotten indications that they seem to be amenable to a lot of the things that the House people are proposing. But it, again, it's a, you know, it, it takes two to tango and it takes three to negotiate a budget. And, and that's kind of the situation we're in right now. Before you get out of here, uh, high Higher education looks like 30 some odd million here for higher education, but there's a catch. Five million will go to these so-called freedom schools at ASU and at U of it. What are freedom schools and why, since when is a higher education money earmarked for particular schools on campus? Uh, higher education money is I, infrequently earmarked. I, I, I have a hard time remembering ever seeing it in, in my decade plus covering the budget. Uh, and you know, the, these freedom schools are basically like economic research, economic freedom market, um, you know, pro-free free market research institutes more or less. Uh, they're, they're not schools where someone would go to be able to go get a bachelor's degree or a, or a graduate degree. They're, they're you know, they're, they're schools, but they're not, you know, they, they don't grant degrees. I think they, they do mm. programs, they do research, they do things like that. Um, it's, you know, it, it's certainly peculiar. So far, no one's really owned up to being... Yeah, who's the, asking for this? Yeah, no one, no, one, no, no one really knows right now. It's, it's kind of the big mystery is these things appeared in the budget. Uh, you know, ASU and U of A and the, and the Board of Regents all say, well, we didn't ask for this. We don't, we don't really know where this is coming from. Uh, legislative leaders have so far said, well, it's, it, it, it just kind of happened. It's not me. You know, I'm not the one that pushed for this. It, it, was an, it was an organic thing that just kind of came up and a groundswell of, of requests for this. And... So here we are. With and the, these free enterprise schools, these ideals, this, this is basically Koch brother backed philosophy, well, correct? Yeah, I mean, certainly the, there's an existing school at ASU, um, and, and I think one down at the U of A, uh, that, that was started by, with, with donations, basically. Yeah, a, ASU money, yeah. accepted, accepted grants and donations from uh, the Koch, uh, Koch Foundation, I think, and, or one of the Koch brothers, uh, to open up this school. My understanding is that this money would go to create a new school, at least certainly at ASU, would, would create a new one um, that I guess would work in tandem or work alongside or be maybe be a competitor. Maybe it's the free market that we have competition for these free market schools at ASU. Is this likely that's something the governor wants or uh, Senate President Biggs wants and they're just putting it in there and saying just vote on it? 
doesn't matter who's pushing it, just vote on it. Well, I think clearly they don't have a problem with it. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been in the final but someone, negotiated But why isn't anyone standing up waving the flag saying, it's me, it's me? Great question. Great question. I, I, yeah, we, we've, you know, we, were, we, we first reported on this two weeks ago, and, and that, the answer we got was a bunch of people going, I don't know, and scratching their heads and saying, well, maybe it's this person, maybe it's that person, but no one, no one really has claimed it. And that's, that, that $5 million, that's likely to make the final cut. I would expect so, yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, we'll see what happens. It's kind of changing by the hour. Uh, good to have the update. Good yeah. to see you. Thanks okay. for joining us. Introducing Classical Arizona PBS, your classical music connection. On TV, listen to Classical Arizona PBS on digital channel 8.4. On the go, download the free Classical Arizona PBS app to stream performances. Find out about classical concerts and watch exclusive videos. Download the free Classical Arizona PBS app. Then follow Classical Arizona PBS on Facebook and Twitter for news, photos, and events near you. Classical Arizona PBS, your classical music connection. Last week, we looked at Proposition 123 from the perspective of a supporter of the measure. Tonight, the other side is represented by State Treasurer Jeff DeWitt, who says that there are alternatives to using land trust money to settle an education funding lawsuit. Here now is Arizona Treasurer Jeff DeWitt. Good to see you again. Thanks Great for being here. Great to see you, Ted. Thank you. All right. Alternatives for Prop 123, which again takes money from the state land trust and uses that money to help uh, reconcile a lawsuit Right. against the legislature for not fully funding inflation-adjusted education funds. All right. right. Alternatives. What alternative is there? Well, first, make sure you, you recognize the flaws in 123, that it's not more money. The two talking points they have is more money for teachers and won't raise taxes. And yet, it's not more money for teachers, and it raises taxes. So I think we can do a lot better. How is it not more money for teachers? I'm hearing, I'm hearing teachers are already being penciled in for raises. In some districts, they're, they're putting this out there. In other cases, though, they're not going to get what they're being promised because, and, and I've been saying this all over the state, not more money for teachers. And about five weeks ago, it was fact-checked in the Arizona Republic. On About five Sundays ago, they fact-checked the statement, more money for teachers. It got zero stars. It was false. There's not one requirement anywhere in Prop 123 that a single dollar goes to a single teacher. And yet they're selling this. We all know we have a problem with our teacher pay. We're one of the lower, the 50th, I mean 50th in the country. And so we have to get it up. But the, the deal is that this was negotiated behind closed doors in the governor's office with the school boards association, and the school boards association wanted no accountability. They promote this on the school board's website to other school board members saying, the great thing about Proposition 123 is there's no accountability in how we spend this money. They don't want to give it to teachers. But, but they, they will eventually have to give it to them. The money will be there. I mean, they may not be promised, it may not be written in stone that you must do X, Y, and Z, but teachers will get more money for the most part, will they not? It remains to be seen. In many cases, they will not. So, you know, the entire budgets of our school is about $10 billion, local, state, and federal money. This is an extra $300 million a year. They're taking the school's own money, giving to them early. So in 10 years, we fall off a cliff. But how do you give out? They're promising. I've, had, I've heard teachers say some, they're getting promised a $10,000 raise, which would be a 30% bump in pay. How do you promise a 30% bump in pay when you're getting a 3% bump in your budget? Someone's going to be disappointed. So what is your alternative then for Prop 123? You say that the, you don't have to go this, this, this whole route here. It's, right. it's easier to do what? Well, since the time that Prop 123 was announced, we have had a lot of extra money come into the state. Since the first time they tried to raid the trust, we had extra, an extra $300 million come in, which JLBC, the budget council down there, uh, budget committee, said $250 million is sustainable. And since then, a lot more money's come in. We are back to peak employment in the state. The whole reason we had this funding crisis was in the downturn, we, we know the state was short cash, and so they went and they took the money away from the schools. 
we're back. We have, we have over $3 billion in cash in the state's operating account right now. We have the highest balance post-tax time any time in the state's history, $3.5 billion. In fact, just the month of April, the amount of money under management in my office for the state went up by over a billion dollars. We've never seen anything like this, $1.1 billion. We're over $14 billion now for the first time managing this money. We have so much cash. All we need is $300 million to solve it for the schools, actually 250 because they'd already appropriated $50 million for it. We could easily solve this and lower taxes. Why would we want to do Prop 123, which raises taxes? Are you talking one-time money, or are you talking continued no. funds? Continued funds. So for over the 10 years, you're saying yeah. the money is there for over the 10 years? Yes. The money's there for, to do this even over if, 10 even years. Even if a downturn in the economy? Even well, if that happens? Well, if there's a downturn in the economy, Prop 123 would cut the funding faster than this money would go away, because Prop 123 has all these triggers put into it where if we see the slightest dip in the economy, then the legislature doesn't have to give the schools any money out of Prop 123. That's one of the biggest complaints that the teachers and the schools have about 123 are all the triggers that are put in place. So this money absolutely would last a lot longer. It would take a very, very severe downturn in the economy, similar to what we saw in the 09, 010, which but prior to that, we hadn't seen since the Great Depression. But it would take a similar kind of downturn in the economy to, to render those triggers, would no, it not? No, no, much smaller downturn to how render so? the triggers. How so? Well, just look at how they're written. I, I encourage everyone to go and read the triggers. And when you see how they're written, it just takes a downturn in the unemployment rate by a certain amount to, to trigger those tr to trigger the triggers. Trigger the triggers. The forty nine percent of the general fund as well. I mean, that that would yeah. you, by the time you got up to that level, would there not be already measures taken? I mean, it would, the landscape, the environment would be so different. I don't know how I don't know how you think it would. We have the money to do it right now, and they're not giving the money to schools. What 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 do you, what reassurance does anyone have? that when there's further money there, they won't take the chance to, to hit those triggers the, the moment they're written. These triggers are written in a very deceiving way, and I encourage everyone to read the wording, and you'll be very scared. Everyone that reads the wording of Prop 123 gets very nervous well, we, about the bill. We've discussed the triggers a lot on this program, okay. and, and, and what we've also uh, found is that those who say the money is there, you don't need to use the land trust, or you right. don't need to go this route, don't understand, I mean, the governor's budget director says you're unrealistic about this. Others folks, uh, Chicken Little, whatever the case may be, Flat Earth Society, I think Rob Rob in the paper. Yeah, I know. Flat Earth Society. But the fact is, there is a political component. It would be wonderful if everyone did certain things. Politicians, elected public officials, sent there by us, right now are saying, they don't want revenue enhancements. They don't want these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And that what you're offering doesn't make political sense in this environment. Do they have a point? And, and yet, they don't want revenue enhancements, that which mean tax increases. And yet, Prop 1, 2, 3 raises property taxes. For some. For many. For, for many. For many. And there are districts, Ted, there are districts, met 45 districts around the state that won't see a dollar out of the trust. All this additional trust money, they won't get a dollar. The only extra revenue their schools will get are from the property tax. In these 45 non-state aid districts, Cave Creek, Scottsdale, all these districts all around the state, big ones, uh, they won't get this. And I've asked, I actually spoke to some people in those districts, and I've, told, I've, you know, I've gone on debates and things, and behind the scenes I'll say, you know this raises taxes, right? And I'll say, yeah, we know it raises taxes, but look, we, all our bond measures get voted down. The only way we're going to get property tax increases through is through a tricky thing like this. So they do it. They go along with bond it. Bond measures get voted down and education officials get frustrated because they mm -hmm. say that education simply isn't a priority in this state. If this gets voted down, how do you convince anyone that education is a priority? When this money is there, uh, this, it's a deal. I mean, it's not perfect. It's, right. it's a deal. Uh, but it's 70 cents on the dollar. It's the best that they could wrangle up. And yet if voters say no, as you want them to do, mm -hmm. who's, what kind of message does that send? Again, the schools have more money in their hand right now from the judgment of the lawsuit. Quite frankly, from the school's perspective, it's one of the worst negotiating uh, negotiating students I've ever seen in my life, how little they're getting on the dollar from the lawsuit they already had. So all I want to do is go back to the judge with the new information we have, which is that we have a lot more money in the coffers than we had when this plan was announced, and let's negotiate a better deal on everyone's behalf, because we're supposed to fund the schools out of the general fund. That's what we're supposed to get. The trust money is there as a supplement. It's going to grow over time as we sell land, but we're never supposed to touch principal. And when we do, it triggers a whole lot of bad things that will come on top of us from Congress and the restrictions we're under through the Enabling Act of the state. But 2.5%, whatever the distribution rate has been for a while now, uh, some are arguing that's, that's artificially low to begin with. And I think you had you on and you were talking 4 point something as opposed to 6.9, which is what 123 right. has for the next 10 years. Okay, 6.9, you, mm -hmm. you think is a little high. 2.5, it's very high. some folks say is way too low. I mean, if you don't get the 6.9, you got to go back to the 2.5.
Well, again, I've said many times that we can go to 3.75 very easily. In fact, in 2012, 2012 is when they ran the measure to set it to 2.5 from the old one, the old formula, because the old formula jumped around Jumped a lot. around, yes. Right. But they had a range established at the time saying they could go from 2.5 to 3.75. Then Treasurer Ducey actually fought to get, get on the low end of that range to stay at 2.5. Now, we can go higher. I, and I said I will fully support going to 3.75. And with a couple small changes, we can go to 5%. If we start putting the lease revenues in and if we do a couple tweaks in how we invest the money, we can, we can get to 5% sustainably over time that will always grow. But doing this 6.9, where you're actually hitting the principal, that's where we violate the terms of the Enabling Act. And that's where it even says in the Enabling Act that oversight well, of our state lands and money could go to the United States Attorney General. We could lose control of that to, to, to Washington. And that's my last question. Uh, will you be pursuing legal action if this thing is approved on May 17th? You know, Ted, I don't think I'll have to because I've heard from two lawyers already that say they're going to. I think there's going to be a race from lawyers to do this. And that's why I keep telling the schools that if Prop 123 goes through, this is going to further delay funding for our schools by another three to five years. They're at the tail end of the previous lawsuit. They have the judgment in their hand, and we can solve it right now. If Prop 123 goes down and we say no, we can solve it right away. But if this goes through, it's going to start a whole new lawsuit that could last another three to five years before our schools see anything. And again, schools get no money then. So uh, is that a good thing, the lawsuit? No, no, no. Don't forget, if, if you say no on 123, the, the, the spigot doesn't turn off. Schools no, still no. get all the money they've been getting. Right, but I mean, I'm talking about the additional funding. Yeah, if they say yes on 123, then the, the spigot could get shut off because the state is obviously planning on this extra money coming in, but the new lawsuits are going to delay that. And, so, that you, and you think that would be good for Arizona? Oh, I don't think it's good for Arizona. I don't think 123 is good for Arizona. Nothing that's happening down there right now is good for Arizona. But I think we can do it better. The, these backdoor closed room deals, which I'm guessing are these cigar filled rooms that the politicians are doing, are not working out for us. We need to get everyone to the table, do this in an open and transparent fashion, and we can absolutely craft a better deal. We have to do something better. Where we, they're, not, they're lying to Arizona. They shouldn't be going and telling people, won't raise taxes, more money for teachers. Both those things are proven false. We can do it the right way, where we actually get more money to teachers, and we can still lower taxes. Got to stop you right there. Good to see you again. Thanks Great for to joining see you. Us. Thanks, Ted. Tonight's edition of Arizona Sustainability looks at attempts to cut down on wasted food. Producer Eleni Dow and photographer Langston Fields take us to Pizza People Pub in Phoenix to see how this particular restaurant is tackling the issue of food waste. Food waste has become a big issue in the past few years. There's about 63 million uh, tons of food waste in the U.S. About 40 percent of the food waste comes in consumers' homes. The other 60 percent are is spread across three sectors, the growers, the uh, preparers, and the distributors. Grocery stores and restaurants are among those distributors, and one restaurant owner found a way to help. Starting at a young age in the restaurant industry, co-owner Mary Beth Scanlon felt she could make a difference with her restaurant, Pizza People Pub. So I've been in the restaurant industry since I was 14 years old, and we have, I've always been bothered by the amount of food that goes into the trash. After opening up the restaurant in 2013, Mary Beth found ways she could help with the ongoing issue of food waste. All of our food goes into the compost, so we have absolutely no food waste that goes to the landfill. So everything that you see on the table after a meal, everything, um, our paper liners, our napkins, uh, any leftover food, including chicken bones, pizza crust, um, anything that's not liquid will go into the, the compost bin. The restaurant goes through Recycled City LLC to compost their food, which is picked up every week. Composting is a daily activity. It comes out to about uh, 200 gallons a week that we donate. But it's not an easy task to compost all of those leftovers. We have to actually pay to compost our food, so it's an extra restaurant expense. And in restaurant, the profit margin is quite small so a lot of people don't want to take on another expense. While there are a few restaurants trying to help improve the growing problem of food waste, there are ways to help at home. We can be more careful about how we buy, prepare, and eat uh, food. Uh, some ideas are to prepare smaller portions uh, so that uh, you're less likely to have leftover food. Make sure that uh, you know what the expiration date of food in your refrigerator is and make sure that you use it before expiration. Buy on a more incremental basis instead of a larger basis. However, buying at an incremental basis and preparing smaller portion sizes may be tough for the restaurant industry. I attribute a lot of the restaurant food waste to uh, portion sizes. 
um, you have to be competitive if you want to serve a, a sensible portion on a plate. Even with big portions at her own restaurant, Mary Beth is finally okay with what is left behind. Well now I feel fine about it, yeah, because I know it's going back into compost. Uh, before it hurt me a lot. I didn't like seeing that, knowing that people are hungry. It just seems so wasteful. But a little extra effort a day can really go a long way. It's worth it. You know, it's really worth it to pay the little bit of extra money and to do something better for our environment. I, if I could show you a scale of like what we've saved from the landfill, it would blow your mind. And think about how many restaurants are in this town. You know, it, what a difference we could make, what a huge impact we could make if we all did it. The Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Department of Agriculture have set a goal of reducing food waste by 50 percent in the next 15 years. To learn more about how to reduce food waste at home, visit EPA.gov. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. The Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability is the heart of sustainability at ASU, advancing research, education, and business practices for an urbanizing world. You can learn more at sustainability.asu.edu/tv.